There are so many benefits shopping with us. You get great savings through discounts for senior citizens and reward cards for loyal customers. Ask about owning yours today. Visit us at Halifax and Grenville Street, St. George, Jubilee Street opposite the Grenville Bus Terminal and at Hillsborough Carico. Our wholesale distribution on Halifax Street also stocks the widest range of pharmaceuticals. We are with you on the hills and in the valleys. We are Hills and Valley Pharmacy. level of convenience and comfort awaits you when you shop at Rise and Shine Supermarket and Hardware Supplies, Griffin Lane, Grenville. Convenient, because we are open Sunday to Sunday. We're even at your service on public holidays. Comfort, because we are easily accessible to the physically challenged. Free Wi-Fi is available while you shop, and bags come at no charge. Everyday low prices and excellent customer care. Adequate parking available. We supply everything you can possibly think of family and home supplies fresh meat vegetables and personal care products all brands of cooking gas at affordable prices you can send in your order have it pulled or pick up express is brought to you compliments ACB Grenada Bank, Simply Smarter Banking, and Giddens Pharmacare, the pharmacy that cares. So you've got the new ACB Smart Card. Around the corner or around the world, you can withdraw cash from any ATM displaying a Visa logo. You can also use it to shop online securely or pay the cashier at any vendor's point of sale machine. Safer than cash. Just tap and go for quick payment. Plus, get transaction alerts to monitor your Smart Card activity. Bank smarter with the ACB Smart Card. Pharmacare, the pharmacy that cares. Halifax Street, St. George's. Affordable access to care, a wide range of prescription drugs, medical supplies, health and beauty items, diabetic testing supplies, immune system support products, vitamins, supplements, and lots more. Visit us today or call 440-2165. Ask about or call in prescriptions, discounted items, and special delivery requests. Kittens Pharmacare. Care, convenience, expertise. We've got it all. Brendan, welcome to the program. A pleasure being able to speak to you, Eugene. Brendan, what does Grenada mean to you? Oh, Grenada's home. It, it is home. It's been home for me. I mean, I left Grenada when I was six. Um, as mentioned before, my family, uh, um, my father's Trinidadian, and my brother and sister were born in Trinidad, but my mum's Grenadian. And she had, uh, when she was having me, I was a baby of the family the third one, um, she went back to Grenada. So that's why I've been fortunate to say Grenada is my home. But I left there when I was six. I was in Trinidad for three years before my mum sent my brother and myself to England. And she joined me, she joined us with my sister after two years. And I didn't come back to Grenada until I was 17. Um, but I remember having this desire to come back to Grenada, um, particularly the last couple of years when I was in England. Um, and I was going to, uh, started playing football and I came back and landed in the old Pearls airport up mm -hmm. in, in Grenville, mm -hmm. um, stayed with my, um, cousins up in the, the Bullings up in uh, St. Paul's next morning. They took me down. I was doing a, a, a radio interview for whips. I was only 17 and my first sight of Granance brought it all back to me of why I love Grenada. And it brought back so many, uh, so many emotions remembering me with my family um, on the beach with my mum, jumping off um, the jetty um, at Grand Anse. And I've never stopped going back. So I was 17 when I went back, and I've never stopped. And um, married my wife, bless her, passed away a few years ago, was from Grenada. Met her in uh, England when she finished coming to college. I've got two children. I've got five grandchildren and all of them, all of them know Grenada because I kept on bringing them back when they were babies. 
And uh, my kids have obviously grown up now, but my kids and grandkids know Grenada very well. And I'll never stop coming back to Grenada. Sorry to hear with your wife. Um, what was your wife's maiden's name? Uh, Sylvester. She was um, um, a well, quite a well-known family. Her dad was a um, fantastic guy, um, uh, Ralph Sylvester. A lot of people knew him as CK. Mm -hmm. uh, founded independence agencies. And um, her, uh, her sister, QT Radix, is known as QT Radix, but uh, her name is Yolan. And her brother, Ken, um, all worked in the business. And um, they're just a fantastic family. And it was uh, Cecily's aunt, Maisie Samuels, who introduced me to Cecily when I was 17. Cecily was 18, coming to college in England. Yeah, so um, the ties with Grenada got even more strengthened. And um, it's always a joy to come back and see my in-laws uh, in Grenada. And uh, Cutie uh, is very kind, and her husband, Peter Radix, uh, very kind, and they let me stay with them on a regular basis, and all the family stay with them and they're great hosts and they're a um, fantastic family, all of them, and I love them dearly. So I have read and it has been said that you didn't find football. Football found you. Would you agree with that and would you expand on it? Explain it. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I'd never seen football until I went to England as a nine-year-old. When I was in Trinidad, there were two major football matches, well, a major football match between the colleges, QRC and Western Boys. I'd heard about it, and I was promised to be taken to, uh, to see one of the games, but I never got there for some reason. I remember walking back home. Um, I lived, we lived in one of the suburbs of Port of Spain. I saw a lot of cricket. I loved it as day. I love cricket. And a lot of hockey, but never saw football. And when I went to England, um, almost to be, as a new kid on the block, almost to be getting with a, a group of lads, a lad called Dennis Sheridan was the lad who introduced me to football. Um, I arrived in the UK in April 62 and it seems to me my recollection is as I, as I started playing football with my friends um, in a big field near where we used to live um, and then in the um, autumn term at school, uh, September, um, after a trial with the football, my, my friend Dennis said to me, come and, come and play, try and play with the school team. And uh, after the first game, I always remember the teacher, Miss Fitzgerald, said to me, um, where do you come from again, Batson? And I said, well, born in Grenada, lived in Trinidad. And he said, well, maybe cricket's your game. Because I think I was so, <laughs> I was so rubbish in my first trial. But it, I think he saw I was on the verge of tears. And he gave me a second chance. I went back for the second uh, little practice. And I must have had a little bit of talent because I seemed to just take to it. Before I knew it, I was in a school team. Then I was in a district side. And it just started from there. I mean, I was nine, coming up to ten. I, I seemed to be playing football every spare minute. And um, when my mum came to England and my sister, we moved to London. I was playing Sunday football then. And um, when I was 13, playing for the district side, Wortham Forest Boys, um, I got spotted by um, a scout from Arsenal Football Club. And I started to train two days a week after school and on Mondays and on Thursdays with Arsenal Football Club. And they, they were the ones that really guided me into the professional ranks. And they were a great club. Then they remain a great club, one of the best clubs in the world. And I'll be forever grateful for the opportunity they gave me. You often, you often seem to downplay the fact that you were the first uh, black player for us now. And as a matter of fact, I've read that you, or I've heard um, maybe from an interview that you said while you were the first, while you were playing for Arsenal as the first black player, you didn't even know it yourself. Tell us a little bit more. <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, and I didn't know that for many, many years. Um, I'd left Arsenal. I think I didn't find out until I, I, literally, I retired. And I was being introduced, I was at um, Stamford Bridge, Chelsea, the home of Chelsea, and speaking at an anti-racism um, meeting and I got introduced and it was the introducer who said to Brennan Batson, first black player to play for Arsenal. And I remember it was sort of shook me and I, because I, I just didn't know. It wasn't relevant to me at the time. Um, it didn't have any importance to me at the time. I was just um, a young professional trying to make his way in the game. I knew there weren't many black players within the game when I first started off. I can name most of them at the time. You know, Clyde Best from Bermuda, 
the Charles Brothers do at West Ham. And uh, they were, I knew there were only a few of us at that time, but it never occurred to me that I was the first black player to play for Arsenal. And I, as I mentioned before, somebody has to be the first and we're accidents of birth. And it fell on me. Um, I only played, I didn't quite make my way there, but um, look, on reflection, I'm, I'm quite proud of the fact because a lot of other black players have said to me, you know, they looked at me a little bit and thought, well, if I can do it, then they can do it. So, um, yeah, but at the time, it didn't really mean a great deal to me. So from Arsenal, you went to uh, Cambridge United and then to West Brom, Albion. Tell us about your journey through English football. Well, as I say, I didn't really make my way at Arsenal and my performances weren't convincing. I think I made about, I made about a dozen appearances. A lot of them were a substitute. Um, and I don't think my performances were um, convincing enough. But having had a taste of being in the first team, I didn't want to go back to the reserves at Arsenal. And I made the decision when I was, I was only 20. Uh, the manager at the time, Bertie, me felt I was being a little bit uh, hasty. But I just did, I wasn't convinced in myself that the staff at Arsenal Football Club, the coaches, were convinced about me. So I thought, I'm going to have to start all over again. And Cambridge United were the first club to come in for me. Um, they were quite a young club in the Football League at the time, and they were in the third division, struggling. And they bought me for £8,000. Um, I didn't quite um, help them avoid relegation. So before I knew, I was, started off from a, a first division club, and within a very short time, I was going to be playing for a fourth division club. But that didn't really matter to me because I just wanted to be in somebody's first team. Uh, we started off the following season, playing in the fourth division, didn't start well. As happens, the manager gets a sack when results are going against the team. And that's when um, Ron Atkinson, who was a young manager, he was his first professional engagement, came to Cambridge United, and he was the one really that transformed my career. Um, taught me some hard truths. Um, we had our differences, but if a player's going to have a difference with a manager, there's only one winner, and that's the manager. So um, my dear wife, who knew nothing about football, gave me the best bit of advice I had at that time and said, why don't you just prove that you're a good player to the manager? And that's how I started off, really. And um, a lot of us could see that this manager, Ron Atkinson, um, was very, very ambitious, um, very infectious, with his enthusiasm, uh, a great man manager. And a lot of us felt if we could just hang on to his coattails, we could possibly be playing in a higher division. And personally, I always felt I was good enough to play in a higher division. Didn't know quite where, but I thought I was better than playing in the fourth division. And um, he made me skipper after a short while. Um, we just missed out on um, getting in the uh, automatic promotion places. The first season he was there. The second season was a bit of a disaster. He wheeled and dealed, got a lot of young players in, um, small money transfers. And um, we're all very ambitious. And in the following season, we won the fourth division um, at a canter, really. And then we were going really well in the third division, literally top, when he got poached to go to West Brom. I think um, the first game after he left, we were playing away to Tranmere, um, up in the northwest. We beat them 1-0, went top of the third division. And then he bought me for £30,000. Um, and that was my last game for West Brom, for, for, uh, sorry, for Cambridge United, went to West Brom, and that was the start of my um, career with West Brom, all because Ron Atkinson had faith in me. I'm sure it wasn't blind faith. He, he obviously <laughs> being an expert, he, he was, saw something that um, he knew could, he saw greatness really. Uh, and talking about that, what are some of the attributes, your personal attributes, your attributes that you think you come with that made your journey um, to the top in football? Well, I think all of us who um, uh, aspire to play the elite end of uh, any sport, we have a desire to compete. You know, we, ha we have, um, you know, it's, it's not just about the winning. Uh, one of the great managers in, uh, the, in England, uh, Bobby Robson, and uh, managed Newcastle, great player in his own right, played for England and uh, managed England. Um, I always remember a phrase he said, um, you've got to love the game more than the result, you know, because there's more 
you have a few ups in the game, but there's a lot of downs as well, you know, and you've got to be able to treat both um, with equal measure in a way, but you've got to love the game. And I fell in love with football as a nine-year-old, um, but I always found I was very competitive. And you've got to be self-critical as well, you know, of your performances, because there'll be a lot of people out there want to pat you on the back and say you played really well when deep down, you know, you, you probably played a bit rubbish. So you've got to be quite self-critical. And I think that was one of the things I found about myself. And that's why I made the decision to leave Arsenal when I was only 20, because I felt I just wasn't going to make my way at Arsenal. And if I wanted to have a, a proper career in the game, I had to leave Arsenal Football Club, which is a great club, but it wasn't the best club for me at the time. And I think it's just a desire to compete. You know, if, you, if you're not a competitor, then there's lots of people behind you who are going to overtake you. Uh, because every game, you know, it's like um, in uh, City Street, you know, there's not 10, 15, 20, 50,000 people watching you and being critical of you. I played in front of 90,000. It was only uh, when I was in China, but, you know, but even then you, you've got to have pride in your performance. And um, if, you, if you don't have pride in your performance and it's not good enough, the manager will maybe give you two bad games and three a push and then you're going to be out of the team. So, you know, you've got to be on your game. Yeah, and the old saying, it's very cliche, you're only as good as your last game. And that's what you have to maintain to really stay in any team. It doesn't matter what level you're pay, playing at, elite or otherwise, you've got to be on your game to stay in the team. At West Brom, you, to me, um, almost gained celebrity status with your colleagues, uh, Regis and Cunningham. Um, known as the what, what the, the three degrees, the three degrees. So <laughs> three tell degrees. me about after, after, tell the, me, after the American top group. <laughs> tell me about the three degrees. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ron Atkinson, for those who know him, he's not shy, and he's very good at uh, one-liners. He's very good at um, self-publicity, but publicity for the club, and you know he was making his way. You know, he went on from West Brom to go and manage bigger clubs than West Brom, you know, Man United being the, the top of the tree, really. And um, it just so happens that at three degrees, um, the American um, female um, group, uh, Prince Charles's favourite group at the time, uh, were appearing in, in Birmingham. And he saw an opportunity, um, not just for him, but to put West Brom on the map. And, of course, there's Laurie, Cunningham, Sirius and myself, um, we were part of a very, very good team. It wasn't just about the three of us. Um, part of a very, very good team, a mixture of um, youth and uh, experience. And he thought, this is an opportunity for some publicity. And I think when somebody mentioned about um, the three degrees appearing in town, he said, well, we've got our own three degrees here in uh, Batson, Cunningham and Regis. And that's how, that's how it started off. And, you know, it's, to this day, it's stuck. And it was... Um, it was a nickname of affection and some one or two people said it well you know it's a bit mickey taken or what have you but you know i think the west brom fans took to us and it was a term of affection and um, to this day i still get pictures we had a we had a publicity shop with the three degrees and they were um, in the autumn or early winter they were in big fur coats um we were wrapped around them together and that picture regularly appears in my inbox when people send it to me. So, um, yes, it's, it stayed in the, uh, it's part of West Brom folklore. It's a great story. Um, also the fact that later on, um, a, a statue was made of the, of the three degrees. Um, tell, tell, tell me about that. Yes, it's, um, it fills me with mixed emotions every time I think about it and talk about it because, um, Laurie Cunningham tragically was killed in a car crash in Munich, uh, sorry, in Madrid. Uh, he was the first black player to play for um, Real Madrid. And he was killed in a car crash in 89. Laurie was, I always say to him, he's a bit like Marilyn Monroe, he'll always be over 33. A uh, very young man when he, uh, when he died. And then um, this one gentleman um, decided that, uh, with, with the West Bromwich um, Council, Sandwell, Sandwell Council it was, um, a guy called Jim, Jim Cadman came up with the idea of having this statue to celebrate. It's called a celebration statue to celebrate the impact, the social impact that the three of us within what's a very calm, uh, diverse community in the Midlands and the impact that we had. 
So it was a matter of uh, fundraising and the statue was unveiled um, in, oh, crikey, I think it's um, 17 or 17 or 18, 18 in 19, uh, 20, 2018. Now, sadly, Cyril was there when it was being, um, when the structure was being um, put together. We went out to the, um, the foundry to see it being done and it was, you know, it's really nice having Cyril there and we're looking forward to it. But sadly, um, Cyril passed away suddenly and tragically um, a couple of months before. I mean, Cyril looked as though he could still play and he, um, he died of heart failure. And it was, um, I mean, it was very, very sad because he looked, he looked magnificent, Cyril. Um, great guy, great to be around. Um, we were always, to, you know, we spent a lot of time together. We lived about a mile apart and we went to a lot of functions. Cyril was like my driver. Um, so sadly, I went to the unveiling on my own. But those two lads will be forever in everybody's memory who've got a love of West Brom. And um, I have pictures of them. And um, as I say, it fills me with mixed emotions, but it's, it's great memories um, of both of them, playing with them. I say Laurie left us very, very early, but had a lot of time with school as well. So I'm forever grateful for that. So as you look at it, um, how, do, how, do, how are things different from when you played to now? <laughs> it's a world of difference. It's a world of difference, Eugene. Mm -hmm. um, firstly, I'll start with the pitches. I mean, the pitches now are absolutely fantastic. The facility is certainly at the top end, but, um, you know, running that all the way through now, um, the, 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 um, the care of pitches um, is so much greater. Um, the technology has gone into pitches, and the pitches look the same, certainly the top end, the top two um, divisions, um, from the start of the season through to the very end. It is unbelievable. Whereas in my time, it was in some grounds, was like a mud bath from about mid-October through till March. And, um, you know, it was no fun playing a lot. But having said that, we coach, you know, every era copes with the conditions, but the pitches are now fantastic. And the stadiums, of course, because of the money that came into the game in 1992 with the Premier League and the riches that bought, the uh, stadiums are fantastic. And I, I'd say again, I've up and down the country, but, you know, the, in the Premiership and in um, the Championship, the stadiums are wonderful places to go to. It's a great, they're great arenas now to watch your sport. And of course the money in the game for the players is far greater than it um, has ever been. And rightly so, because they're the ones that um, people got to watch. And they're the ones that the TV companies pay that money for. So they should be rewarded for their efforts. The other question um, one of my buddies had for you is, who was your favorite player in your time? Gosh, that's difficult, really. Um, I mean, I, I never... I, there's so many players, but George Best. I remember seeing George Best in the flesh, and he was a joy. I mean, everybody talks about Pele as one of the greats. Of course, he was in Madonna, Maradona. I saw Maradona play at um, Old Trafford. I saw um, Zinedine Zidane. I mean, he's a big build for a midfield player, magnificent. But George Best was almost, you could almost put his movement to music. He was, and he played with such flair. And yet, talk about. Um, Dedication would have been George Best would literally finish by the time he was 26. Mm. Because off the field, he was just his own person and he had all sorts of problems. But watching him, I saw him play at Fulham, I think, um, in his heyday. And he was absolutely breathtaking. I mean, he was blessed by the gods. Mm -hmm. Fantastic player. Yeah. You have done, I know you're retired from the game now, but it seems like you've done just as much off the field as you did on the field. Tell us about some of the things that you have been involved with um, since retiring. Well, I retired in 84. I had a, picked up another, another bad injury, knee injury, and I, after about 15, 16 months, I called it a day. But I was very involved with the uh, PFA, the Professional Footballers Association, the, old, the oldest sporting association in the world, founded in 1907. And uh, it's a players' union. Um, so all the players played elite end in England and Wales, are um, members of the PFA um, from the professional ranks. And um, Gordon Taylor, who's just retired as um, chief executive of the, the PFA, I've been on a management committee. That's a, that's a player's board. 
Um, you can be on that. You get elected onto that whilst you're still a player. And I was on the management committee. I had to stand down because of my, my retired. And Gordon Till asked me to come in with him. Um, he had a. He was a great visionary, Gordon. He had uh, ideas about transforming the PFA. And uh, I joined him in um, May 84. And I had 18 fantastic years with him through a lot of um, momentous occasions, memorable occasions um, in the, with the PFA and football in general. The main one being the, um, the onset of the Premier League, which was um, founded in um, 1992 and all the riches that brought to the game and the players benefiting from it. Um, so I've been an administrator all my life since I retired from playing. I wish my playing career was as long as my administrative career. <laughs> that would be even better. <laughs> but um, I remember a seminal moment when I realized I'd uh, been retired longer than I played. It was a seminal moment for me. But uh, um, I've been very fortunate, Eugene, to spend all my work in life involved in the game. You know, I started as an apprentice in, um, when I was 16 in uh, 1969. I signed pro when I was 17, and I've been involved in the game ever since at different levels. So now I, I chair the PFA charity, fantastic uh, charity. Uh, so the players, when they retire and they need to, or while they're still playing, they may want to look to um, prepare for uh, the transition out of the game and they want to do educational courses or vocational courses to lead them into another qualification. The charity is, um, we have an education fund as part of the charity. Um, another one is a benevolent fund for players who may be falling hard times. Not every, not every player can retire from the game and say, I've got enough money to live. You know, most players retire mid-30s. So we've got a lot of life to live thereafter. So there are some difficult times ahead, for, maybe for some players. So I chaired a charity. I am um, chairman of a group called the Professional Players Federation, which is all the major player associations under one umbrella. So we've got PFA, we've got football, Scottish football, we've got jockeys, golfers, um, uh, athletes, um, snooker players, darts players, so all the major players, cricketers, rugby players, all under one umbrella. And I'm president of a similar group in Europe um, called EU Athletes. We get a lot of our funding through the European Commission, and that's enough for me. Um, I retired, and I'm, I'm now resident in Spain. I'm talking to you from my, my apartment where I live in... Um, overlooking a beach. It reminds me of Granans, but not as pretty. <laughs> um, so I've always, I've always wanted to be near the water. And I bought this apartment um, many years ago. And my daughter has been living, and my three grandkids with her, have been living in uh, Spain now for 17 years, and we have a house up in the hills. So, um, and my son lives in Slovenia, and he's got twin girls. So <laughs> we're scattered a little bit, but um, it's very easy now to travel around. And um, as I say, I've been really fortunate to, to be involved in sports at the very highest level all my life. I guess in your professional career, you must have seen racism in, in one form or another. Are you satisfied that that enigma is being addressed in the sport today? Well, I wouldn't say I'm satisfied. I think it is being addressed, but you know, it's been a long time uh, issue. And even the current players now are saying not enough is being done. Certainly in my time, I mean, I speak to players of a different era, and they, when they know what people like Laurie Sill, myself, Clyde Best, you know, Ian Wright, all these players you can think of going through the different um, decades had to put up with. Um, it's astonishing that it took till 1993 to have a, a national anti-racism campaign, which was set up by um, the PFA and the CRE, whose um, CEO at the time was um, Herman Oosley, who's now Lord Oosley. You know, it was his brainchild, but using football as a vehicle to address the issue. If you wind it forward now to the current times, you've got players who've got much more of a, a voice. You know, they've got a, uh, they're, they're prepared to address the social issues directly through their different social media platforms. You know, and um, you think of somebody like uh, Marcus Rashford, who's not only talked about um, uh, anti-racism, but also socialism about uh, kids who can't um, 
you know, needing school meals. And uh, yeah, you know, it's fantastic what he did, yeah. making the government make a U-turn. But certainly, um, you know, the uh, Black Lives Matter movement really kind of galvanized, I think, um, a lot of players. And uh, now we're saying, well, you know, players are still taking the knee um, prior to kickoff at games. Symbolically, it still has an impact. But the next question is, well, when are we going to see real change? And there's a bill going through Parliament at the moment called the um, Online Harms Bill, which is going to address some of those issues about um, uh, race abuse online. Um, we saw it happen in the Euros with the three black players who um, two had penalty saved and one um, had a miss on Marcus Rashford again. But the abuse they took again brought that to the head. Uh, to a head. So I think um, players are now uh, bec becoming more impatient to see change. You know, it's okay having symbolic gestures. Now we want to see real change. And we need to see change in action, not just being talked about. Brendan, what advice, encouragement can you give the young kids sitting at home right now watching this interview and who wants to be the next Brendan Batson? <laughs> what, <laughs> what advice well, can you give that, that young person? Well, I think the only advice I can give really is that you've got to be playing. You've got to play. And the younger you start, the better opportunity you may have to succeed at a high level. You know, there's a stat, we use a statistic saying um, 10,000 hours um, of practice, you know, so that just not just in sport, but in the arts, anything you want to do to become proficient in it, you know, they talk about 10,000 hours. So you, the earlier you start, you know, and you don't need to be in a team for football, you, you just need ball on the wall. You know, you've got to familiarize yourself with the football. You can play with your mates, you can play with a wall, you can play with your mum, your dad, your brother, your sister, whatever. And then you get into the team structure. But you've got to be dedicated as well. You know, there's many a player with enormous talent who don't succeed because they're not dedicated enough. Um, and there are many a player with lesser talent who have succeeded because they're dedicated. You know, you've got to sacrifice a lot. You know, people think it's easy playing football. You know, they get paid a lot of money, they get this and that. But any sport you see, You've got to sacrifice a lot. You know, you can't go out partying and being with your maids and drinking and all that sort of stuff. So if you've, got, if you've got a talent, you should try and develop it. And if you're talking about football, then you've got to play the game. You've got to play, you've got to play, you've got to play because there are lots of people out there looking for talent. Talent is a limited resource. And a lot of people out there looking for talent. You know, some wonderful stories. You see what's happened with the African nation players. Um, the way they've come through, you know, with literally nothing um, to go with in some of the uh, villages they come from, but they've managed to have a game of football. And um, they've been spotted and they, they, they've been developed and they've, they've acted as role models. Um, and there's been a conveyor belt of players from African nations and all over the world because football is a global sport. Is there anything else, one, that any final comment you'd like to, to make? Not really, you know, I, I think you see my flag at the back here, you know, and um, I, um, I have ambitions to um, do some island hopping later this year. I'm going to come down to Grenada. I have hardly missed coming to Grenada. Even during COVID, I managed to get across. I was doing some, uh, working on a project in Barbados and um, jumped through all the hoops to get across. My good friend, um, Leo Garbutt and his family were very kind and let me stay for a few days at the, um, the Calabash Hotel. Um, whilst I do my quarantine, uh, what a place to be able to do your quarantine. I mean, it's ridiculous. I couldn't even go and stay with my sister-in-law because I had to, but I did my quarantine there. They were very kind to me, um, him and uh, Lily and his wife and, uh, and all the family. I uh, did my, my um, quarantine there and then I went to uh, my sister-in-law. So um, I'm coming back down in November, God willing, uh, with my grandson, my grandson, Louis, again, he's the eldest of my grandchildren, took his first steps in Grenada. Mm, nice. uh, you go on the 9th of um, uh, January and uh, with my um, I stayed, he took his first test at my aunt's house uh, Lindy um, Lindy Webster and her husband Rudy and um, he's going to be there for Christmas we're going to be there for Christmas and he's going to take he's going to have his 21st birthday with me in Grenada so fingers crossed 
I hope to see you in Grenada in November, November, December sometime. Well, I'll definitely be looking forward to that, and I'm sure the rest of Grenada will as well. Pharmacare.